Today, Pastor Jamie continues our series called This Generation, where we will look at how we cannot allow a cancel culture to keep us quiet about our faith. So take a moment and prepare your heart for today's worship. Um, maybe you've gone on trips before and you've looked, you, maybe you've had your trip planned out for a week and you've started looking at the weather. Anybody ever do this? You start looking at the weather out in advance of your trip, seeing what the weather's going to be like. And you're kind of hoping that you see it, but then when it gets time for that, the weather's changed <laughs> and it's not what it said it was going to be. Back in the sixties, there was a, there was a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His name was Edward Lorenz. And he coined this term that you've probably heard of before, the butterfly effect. You ever heard that? Before, yeah, he coined that term, the butterfly effect, because he said that they, it was this whole debate about predicting weather long term out. They said, well, you ought to be able to use current conditions and historic data to figure out what the weather is going to look like. Well, he's like, no, the weather is unpredictable. And not only that, there's these small little variables that can play an effect and have an impact on something uh, uh, far away. So he used this far fetched example of a butterfly. If a butterfly flaps its wings, those wings could maybe cause a tornado somewhere in another part of the world or even prevent one. And so that's where this term butterfly effect came from because there's small little variables that could play a part in making an impact on something around the way. Well, that's kind of what we've been talking about over these last several weeks with this generation. We may not be able to predict the outcome that, that, that of what we can have of an impact on one generation to another, but there's no doubt that the way we act as a generation, the way we react, the way we respond, the way we talk, those things are variables that play in the formation of generations that come up behind our generation, whatever generation you're in. And we, as we said in the very first week, that we, we can have not just a butterfly effect, but a domino effect. As one generation leans into another generation, right? We have the opportunity to make an impact on what happens in the, the up and coming generations behind ours. So we talked about it. We began looking at that. And we talked about the fact that I, when I laid that foundation for us, we said, look, every generation has its own set of problems, right? Maybe the older generation in here, you remember your generation and things you faced, uh, you know? And you, uh, oftentimes we hear that this generation is a lot different. You didn't face the things this generation faced, but you still had things you faced, right? And you had God that was with you through those things that you faced. And while this generation may have different things that they face, or a younger generation may have different things that they face, you can share how God helped you through your problems and how he can help them through theirs. But the thing is that uh, previous and older generations don't need to be one of the problems of the younger generation, right? I didn't want the previous generation before me to be part of my problem when we had enough of our own. We need to get together and work together and how we can help each other and encourage each other and grow with each other within our generations. In week two, if you were here, Pastor Brandon Tichy from North Carolina, a good friend of mine came and spoke. I pray you were encouraged by his message. I've heard a lot of great feedback from him coming and he thoroughly enjoyed being here with you guys. Uh, he, he had a blast. He loved it. He spoke so highly of y'all and I'm so grateful for your openness and welcomeness to him. But he talked to us and reminded us the importance of passing the baton from generation to generation, that that is so important that we do that. And he talked about passing the baton of faith, the baton of worship, the baton of generosity, the baton of prayer, and the baton of sharing the stories of God's faithfulness in our life. And then last week, Pastor Caleb did such a beautiful job explaining and talking to us about the fact that, you know, this generation, just like every generation, has cultural influence that it faces. There's things in our culture that want to influence our life, right? And every influence in every culture has been different. And one of the primary things that the culture around us today wants to influence on us is this argument of my truth over the truth, over there being a the absolute truth. You hold to your truth. It's what's good for you. But he told us so beautifully from God's word of how that's dangerous, that there's only one truth. And that truth is found in Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And as the prophet said, we have to be cautious of, guard, of, of listening to our heart because our heart is deceptive. You know, it's well, well, just go with your heart. Just go with your, you know, let your heart lead you. No, your heart is deceptive. Your feelings don't always lead to truth. We've got to let our feelings line up with the truth, right? And so he did a beautiful job of, of taking us down that course. As we go into what we're going to talk about today, I want to throw some words, or I'm not going to do it. It's not, not like magic. I'm going to have the, those in the booth back there do this for me. I've got some words that they're going to put up on the screen, all right? Outrage. Do you see this in our culture at all? 
Anybody ever see outrage in our culture? Yeah. How about this next one? Call out. Do you see anyone calling out anyone in our culture? You ever see that happening? How about this one? Cancel. Do you see people getting canceled in our culture? We see it all the time. These words reflect the, the, the atmosphere of our culture so greatly, the climate of our culture. This is what we see all throughout. People are in such outrage and, and, uh, and, and people are calling somebody else and trying to quiet somebody down. And most of them will say the whole reason they're doing this is because they're, it's an argument around free speech. And some will say this is an argument for free speech. We're trying to silence the voices that have been too loud too long and raise the voices that have been too quiet too long. Others will say, no, this is an argument against free speech because you're trying to dictate who gets to actually speak and who gets to actually talk and who gets to actually say things. I want you to think about something. Generation, generation Z, which is the youngest active generation uh, in this overall generation today. Generation Z is the first generation to have ever lived the totality of their life so far without ever not having the internet. They've always had the internet, right? The internet has been a part of their life ever since they were baby. Parents, maybe you remember when they got a little rowdy, you couldn't get them to be quiet. You took this and you handed it to them and said, here, watch this, right? <laughs> right? No judgment, right? We've been, we're guilty, right? You just want some peace, right? But they're a generation that's grown up only knowing the internet. The thing about the internet is that there's a lot of people in the internet that are very bold, very bold online. And often they're very bold because they're sitting behind a screen, not in front of somebody, right? But they're very bold. And their boldness is not often beautiful. It's not often beautiful. It's often very angry. It's often very ugly. But we look at this and we can think, you know what? We can try to find some positives in this. And we can see that because of that nature, that we are living around a generation, around a people, people in our world that clearly believes that there is the reality of transgression. In other words, they believe that there's something that's right and there's something that's wrong and that you can do things wrong that abuse the things that are right. And if you do the things that are wrong, then you should have some type of penalty for those things that are wrong, a transgression that is pain. So there must be that within our culture, right? There must be that where they believe that there's some type of moral goodness that says we want there to be moral purity. So we've got to have moral purity. We've got to cleanse of the wrongdoing. Well, the problem is how morality is defined. That's, that's kind of the big problem that, of how they're defining morality. And in the process of trying to do what they think is good and, and silence the wrong, they're not just destroying wrong behaviors, they're destroying people. And there's an argument, this is a totally different discussion, but there's an argument in apologetics even. You know what apologetics, apologetics is defend, defending your faith, the act of defending your faith that says, if we believe that there is a, most people have this innate belief that there are things that are morally right and there are things that are wrong, right? That you have your, this, it just kind of comes up. You think about a child, for example, we talk about children, we don't have to teach children to sin. They just kind of start doing it, right? Because it's that nature that's in them. But think about this from a child's point of view too. If you got two children, we were blessed to have two from the get-go. We never knew what it was like for you spoiled parents that only had one. We didn't know that. We had two. We started with twins, right? And so we got to watch two sinful natured people, right? Right in front of us, right? And so, and, and so, so if one kid took from the other kid, that one kid was like, well, I know that's wrong. And so they react for their wrongdoing, right? And they slap the one that took the thing from them right? Because their sinful nature rose up. They don't know how to respond to it. But there's this innateness within us that knows there's a right and there's a wrong. And because there's a right and the wrong, then that right and that wrong must come from somewhere. That must mean that there is a moral law giver that has originated the moral law that is written on our heart. 
And so for us to actually determine what is truly morally right and what is truly morally wrong, we need to discover the moral law giver in order to turn, turn, uh, figure that out. And so us as followers of Christ, we're sitting over here like, ooh, ooh, I know the answer to that one, right? I can point us to the one who is the moral law giver. But the way that we do that, it has to be done in a way that reflects the culture of Christ and the kingdom of God, not our own humanity, which at the root of it and the heart of it is a sinful nature that Christ is helping us overcome. Right? So we, we need to have a boldness within us, yes, but we need to have a boldness that comes from a place of brokenness. Go with me to Psalm chapter 51. This is a psalm that David wrote And this was a prayer that David prayed. This happened after David was confronted by the prophet Nathan. When Nathan came to him and confronted him about Nathan's sin, his affair with Bathsheba. And then when uh, when David uh, put, uh, put Bathsheba's husband on the front line of the battle for him to be killed. When Nathan confronted David over that, David wept and he was broken over his sin. And he began to write this psalm as a prayer. In Psalm 51, starting at verse 10, It says, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Don't banish me from your presence. Don't cancel me out, God. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore restore to me the joy of your salvation. Make me willing to obey you. Then I'll teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood. This is in regards to him putting Bathsheba's husband on the front line. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips. Don't let my lips be silent. Don't let my lips stay, stay, stay quiet. Unseal my lips that my mouth may praise you. And then he begins to portray an understanding of new covenant love from God before the new covenant ever existed. He said, you do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer you one. You don't want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, oh God. David is broken over his sin. He's broken over what he has done and the nature of his heart that led him to do what he did. And he's asking God to break him more even for the world around him. And that God can use his brokenness. It's not that David wants to now cower back and not be bold. He says, unseal my lips. I want to be even bolder for you. And my sin doesn't cancel me. God, break me so that I can be even bolder in my faith for you. Boldness is a theme that we see all throughout Scripture. Do just a quick Bible drill. Maybe as you were growing up, if, if you ever went to church as a kid and you grew up in kids' church, maybe they did these with you. These were called Bible drills. They'd call out a passage of Scripture. You have to be the first to stand up and read it. We're not going to do that, but, but let's just go through some Scriptures real quick. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 20. That David continued, be strong and courageous and do the work. I love that part. (laughs) Don't just be strong and courageous, but do the work. Don't be afraid or discouraged for the Lord God, my God is with you. He will not fail you. He will not forsake you. Second Chronicles 32 verse seven, it says this, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged. Do you see a theme running through, through this at all? Because of the king of Assyria or his mighty army, for there is a power far greater on our side. And then I love the way uh, Solomon sums up how our hearts should be as followers of God, as followers of Christ. This is my youngest son's favorite verse, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1. And this is why the wicked run away when no one is chasing them. That's why it's his favorite verse. Only the wicked run when no one's chasing them. Why would you run just to run? Who does that? But Proverbs 28, no, the wicked run when no one's chasing them. But the godly, this is where I want to focus. The godly are as bold as lions. Now, all of these verses were in the Old Testament. The, the fight in the, in the Israelite history in the Old Covenant was a little bit different. But there's no doubt that the characteristic of boldness still needs to be a part of our life today. We still need to be bold. Let's, so let's go into the New Testament. Let's see a couple from Paul. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. A final word. He's wrapping up his letter. 
And he encourages them with this statement, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Very similar to all that we saw in those scriptures from the Old Testament just a second ago. Put on God's full armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Then he writes this to the church of Philippi, Philippians chapter one, verse 27. He says, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Verse 28, he says, or he goes on in verse 27, then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I'll know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Verse 28, he goes on, he says, don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they're going to be destroyed, but they, you, that you are going to be saved even by God himself. Verse 29, for you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. How's that a privilege, right? And then he goes to verse 30, he says, we are in this struggle together. You've seen my struggle in the past. You know I'm still in the midst of it. Paul is saying, look, we do have enemies. We have a spiritual enemy that we face every day of our life that's constantly out to get us. But he, and he says that we also have other enemies. And another way to translate that is opponents because there's all, there are people that oppose faith in Christ. They oppose Christ and they oppose the faith in Christ. There are those that oppose that. But Paul also says that, that in this life and in this journey as followers of Christ, it's not always gonna be all peaches and cream and roses and perfect. We're gonna face difficulties. There's going to be things that we have to suffer through just as Christ suffered for us. So that means that when bad things are happening around us, when bad things are happening to us, when bad things are being said about us or being talked about us, it doesn't mean that God has abandoned us. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. Listen, this generation needs to be a generation that doesn't just give God glory when everything is good and then turn around and blame God for everything that's bad. This generation has got to be a generation that gives God glory in every circumstance, in every situation, in everything we face, in everything we see, in everything we go through, and understand that his good purposes will come out of everything. We have to trust God. We have to obey him. We have to follow him. But we understand that when we look at this, Paul said there's an eternal end to all of this as well. But here's what we know about boldness. Boldness can become brash. It can become harsh. It can become rude and crude and impatient and angry and belligerent. And oftentimes it can become that way disguised as Christian courage. And that's why our boldness has to always come from a place of brokenness because our brokenness in Christ will keep us at a place where we're humble and we don't allow ourselves to get to that place. We're called to love those who are against us, to pray for those who attack us. Like Paul says, we, we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against the principalities and the powers of the world. And those principalities and powers of the world are the ones that are influencing the ones that are opposed to us. So we fight against the spiritual enemy. Now, we have to understand, we have to know that when we speak with boldness from a place of brokenness, that we don't speak with the intention of offending, okay? The goal is not to be offensive. Peter, when he talked about sharing our hope, that he says you do it with gentleness and respect because you're not just looking out saying, I'm talking about this, I don't care about what you, you, you wish on your heart, right? The goal is not to be offensive, but we can't be afraid to speak of our faith because we're afraid we may offend someone. Truth is offensive. Have you ever been offended by the truth before? I imagine you probably have because truth will offend the lies we don't want to let go of. Truth will offend the things that in the actions of our life that we don't want to let go of and that we don't want to stop doing. We get offended over it. Even if we won't admit it's truth. So the goal is not to just speak whatever, however we want to do it and not care how we, treat, how we come across to someone. The goal is not to be afraid to speak the truth because we're afraid we're going to offend someone. 
And at the same time as Christians, as followers of Christ, we cannot be so easily offended by those around us in the world primarily. We can't be offended when the world acts like the world. We should become more broken over the state of the world around us. We have to be a people with thick skin and soft hearts (laughs) and not let that happen. That's why we are bold with brokenness. If you go back and look again at the Beatitudes, we, we talked about this in the very first message from our Ethos of Jesus series. All of those characteristics of the Beatitudes are characteristics of someone from a broken spirit in Christ. It's not a broken down, beaten down spirit. It's a broken spirit in him that's been rebuilt and built back up by the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, there, there's so many things. And, and you know, when we looked at, at that and we looked at our Now What series and what happened after the resurrection of Christ, we looked at the, the series on the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit worked through people. I encourage you, go pull those scriptures back up and just study those scriptures and look again at the passages of how God used people who were broken. They became broken over the state of their condition, of their sinfulness before God. They became broken for the state of a lost world around them. And then they began to allow God to use them with boldness to reach out to the world around them. One of the passages of scripture that we looked at back in one of those series, one of my favorite was Acts chapter four. In Acts chapter four, this is when Peter and John, they had been preaching and teaching and they saw a crippled man healed and they were arrested And the Sanhedrin and the religious leaders told them this. They they told them that, that you need to stop talking about Christ. And Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you (laughs) rather than him? And they go on and they say this in verse 20, they say, we cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. In other words, they were trying to be silenced and they said, respectfully, we're not going to stop talking. So they left that place and they went back to their other followers of Christ, other fellow believers. And they said, we need to pray. And so they began to pray. And we see their prayer, verse 29. It says, and now, O Lord, hear their threats. Give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. We talked about this if you were here. They didn't pray, God, do something to them, quiet them. God, free us, take us away from here, lead us somewhere else. God, put a hedge of protection around us. God, help us to be safe. No, they prayed, God, give us more boldness. And then what happened after they prayed that? Verse 31. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they preached the word of God with boldness. They preached the word of God with boldness. You're like, Jamie, weren't they already filled with the Spirit at the day of Pentecost? Yes. But our being filled doesn't mean that we stop continuing to be filled by the Holy Spirit and continuing to seek God pour, rain down your presence on my life so that I overflow. And that's exactly what they went out and did. They preached the word of God with boldness. Their, the behavior of boldness was born from their belief in Christ and what they believed about Christ and who he was. This is what an older part of this generation needs to model for the younger part of this generation. A, bold, a boldness born out of what we believe. This is what a younger part of this generation needs to continue to carry into future generations, a behavior of boldness born out of what we believe. You know, so, some of us kind of live by the old saying that's attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, and it's not calling him Assisi or where he lived Assisi. It's, that's the place. That was the location. It was St. Francis of Assisi. And, but many scholars believe that that quote is mis. Uh, falsely attributed or misquoted because the quote doesn't really reflect who St. Francis of Sissy was, the totality of it. The quote is this. The quote is, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. Have you heard that quote, that statement? There's no doubt that our life should be an example. There's no doubt that our life should set an example and that we should let our life be a model for those that know we are followers of Christ. There's no doubt but we should also speak boldly about what we believe. We should, and, and that's why they think this quote was misquoted or falsely attributed because St. Francis of Assisi was a man that was not a sissy. He was not afraid to speak what he believed boldly and with faith. Now think about this as an example. Let's say we're out on a hiking trip and I'm leading this trip. I can promise you this is never gonna happen because I don't hike, all right? I did one time and this happened to me. 
while hiking. So I don't hike anymore, all right? So, but we're on a trip and we're hiking and we're coming on this trail and there's a snake out front and I see that snake. Now I can model for you that I'm gonna run, walk widely around where that snake is very cautiously, you know, and, and with something out to try, you know, whatever. I can model that, but you could be lost in the beauty of the nature around you, right? You could be looking up in the trees and see a gigantic, beautiful bird building a nest or feeding its babies. You could look out in this creek and see deer drinking the water and like, man, that is so beautiful. Where's my gun, right? And then you could, you could look out and you could be looking, maybe it's sunrise, sunset in the sky. There's a beautiful hue of pink and orange. And you're like, man, this is so great. You're not paying any attention. Maybe you're bored completely on this hike. And because we're a generation that doesn't know life without the internet now, you're on your phone. You're not paying any attention to what's going on around you or me in front of you. And so you're not watching how I'm modeling. Wouldn't it be better if rather than me try to model avoiding that snake, that I say, hey, there's a snake, right? And I speak boldly of what I about, about what I know is true right in front of me. Wouldn't that be better? There's nothing wrong with modeling and influencing with our life and letting our life be an example, but we cannot be afraid to speak boldly about what we believe deeply. Listen, I love also when you look back in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, when the Sanhedrin were looking at Peter and John, they were amazed by Peter and John. And this is what they were amazed about. The members of the council were amazed when they saw their boldness, all right? For they could see they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. I love that word ordinary. God uses ordinary people and gives ordinary people extraordinary boldness. But let me give you a fun little lesson about that word ordinary. That word ordinary in the Greek, that Greek word is idiotes. Yeah. It's where we get our word idiot from, right? God gives idiots boldness, right? And you're like, I know, I've seen the videos, right? But and you're like, Javen, I'm not an idiot, right? And I, I know, but many of you have grown up in the South. Many of you have moved here to the South, and you've been here long enough now, and you've heard the phrase, bless your heart. Anybody ever been told, bless your heart? I've got good news for you today. God can use you, okay? Because that's what, that's what that means. That's what that means. But let me, let me give you a little clarity on, that, on the word, on the Greek word there. Actually, that word in ancient Greece was not as offensive as it is today. It didn't, it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't meant to be that way. Now it wasn't a compliment either, but it wasn't as derogatory as we take it today. The word then, when they used the word idiotes, it, it was a word that talked about common people that didn't have influence in the society around them. They didn't have a voice within the culture. And so when the Sanhedrin and the council were looking at Peter and John, they were amazed that they were so bold because they were just ordinary idiotes. They were common people that didn't have a voice in society and a voice in culture. And God was using these people who had a voice to impact the culture around them. That's why they were amazed. God gives, or, gives ordinary people extraordinary boldness to speak boldly about what we believe deeply. And that boldness has got to be birthed from a place of brokenness in our heart over our sin and what Christ has done. They were amazed by it. Listen, Christianity today, especially in America, it still holds some type of influence. It still holds some influence. But there is likely coming a day when followers of Christ will be the social minority in our world and in our nation. And if we think that we have to have the influence that we're accustomed to having to be followers of Christ, then we've missed the point. Paul tells us that our Savior, our Lord, emptied himself of everything. He emptied himself of his power. He emptied himself of his privilege, all for the sake of others. And God wants to give us boldness to do the same, even if we're in the eyes of the world, just common, ordinary people. Because common, ordinary people, empowered by a supernatural, extraordinary God, <laughs> can do amazing things. As we land this plane, I want to share a story from the Israelite history, from the Old Testament, of a king by the name of King Jehoshaphat. 
This really reflects very well of what, what Christ is calling us to. But King Jehoshaphat was king of, of, uh, of Judah at, at the time. And in chapter 18 of Second Chronicles, we see that he has, he's talking to the king of Ahab, who's the king of Israel. And Ahab is asking him to go into battle with him, to go into war with him. And Jehoshaphat's like, hey, okay, let's do this. But first we need to, to seek a word from God through a prophet. We need to hear from the truth of God. And so they call up a prophet. Now, here's the thing about Ahab. Ahab had prophets, but let's think back to last week. Remember words from Pastor Caleb. The prophets that Ahab had were people that only told him what he wanted to hear. Well, a prophet comes in by the name of Micaiah, and Ahab doesn't like what the prophet Micaiah says and disregards what the prophet Micaiah says, disregards the truth of God's word that he speaks to him. And they go out into battle, and Ahab dies. Jehoshaphat survives. He comes back. He's in his home. Well, now Jehoshaphat is being threatened by three different armies that they're about to go to war with his nation. And scripture tells us that Jehoshaphat is terrified. That's a normal reaction. That's a normal response. He's afraid. He's terrified. But fear doesn't have to be the opposite of faith. That's a natural reaction. But what fear can do can become an opportunity for our faith. It's an opportunity to live out with boldness what we believe and to demonstrate our boldness. So Jehoshaphat begins to pray and begins to seek God for direction. And we see him pray this in verse seven of chapter 20. He says, our our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people Israel arrived? Did you not give this land forever to your, to the descendants of your friend Abraham? What Jehoshaphat doing is reminding God of his promises. This land is ours because you promised it to us, God. You gave us this and we are resting on what you've given us. And there's no enemy that can take what you've given us. We need to remember the promises of Christ the promises of God that are yes and amen in Christ. Paul tells us in Romans chapter eight that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. There is no hardship. There is no persecution. There is no famine. There is no sword. There is no condemnation that can take us away from Christ. We are in Christ. There's nothing that can silence our faith in him. He wrote his letter to the Corinthians and he said, you might be pressed against, but you are not crushed. You might be perplexed, but you are not in despair. You might be hunted down, but you are not abandoned. You might be knocked down, but you're not destroyed. These are the promises of Christ and we need to hold on to those and we need to remember them. Even if there's people around us trying to silence us for our faith, we still continue to speak boldly about what we believe deeply from a heart and of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Everything we face in this life is an opportunity to reveal Christ in us. So then Jehoshaphat concludes his prayer this way in verse 12. He says this, he says, Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We don't know what to do, but we're looking to you for help. Other translations say our eyes are on you. Our eyes are focused on you. And that's what we always have to be. Our eyes always have to be focused on our heavenly father. We cannot let the things around us, what's being said around us, what's being said about you, what's being said to you, to distract you. Our focus always has to be on God. So he prays this prayer. And then next, God begins to speak through one of the other people standing there within within the Uh, the party of people. Verse 15, it says this. He said, this pan said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Y'all remember that from earlier? By this mighty army for the battle's not yours. It's God's. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against the principalities and the powers of this world. And let me tell you something about that battle. That battle has already been won. That war has already been won. There may be these little, little individual battles where it looks like our enemy might have a victory, but the overall war is won. It's over. Our spiritual enemy is fighting from a losing position. That's why we take a stand from a place of victory and we fight with victory. Then Jehoshaphat looks at his people in verse 20. He says this, early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you'll be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. Boldness is a behavior born out of belief. Let the God you believe in create a boldness for him out of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. And then they begin to, they go out and he sends out the army, he sends out in front of them worshipers and they begin to proclaim boldly what they believe deeply. Verse 21, 
After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. The theme of their worship was the love of God. Listen, Jesus, when we look back at what Jesus did, he often confronted sin. He never canceled people. He extended grace that was aligned with truth. He loved others and he wanted them to experience the abundant life that he had to offer them. When we think about canceling, every single person on the face of this earth deserves to be canceled when it comes to our our sin. We don't deserve to be in the presence of God, much less be used by God. But Jesus Christ in an extraordinary act of love and grace and forgiveness came and offer us something far better than what we deserve. He offered us life. And so our life should be one that is lived that carries the name of Christ and reflects his character and speaks boldly about the one we believe in deeply. Now, in with this story. Babe Ruth, maybe you've heard of him. He's one of the great, greatest home run hitters in the history of baseball. When you look at him, Babe Ruth, when he was alive, he signed a lot of baseballs, autographed a lot of baseballs, but he only autographed, it said, seven baseball bats, seven baseball bats. And for the longest time, one of those bats went missing. No one knew where it was. There was a man that became sick. This was in, and in the 80s, late 80s. He had no one to take care of him. He had no one to watch over him. He had no one to, to, to leave an inheritance to, nothing like that. But he had a nurse who would come and take care of him. The nurse's name was Marcia. In 1988, this man passed away. But before he passed away, he told Marcia, he said, Marcia, you have been so good to me. Yeah. And you've been... <laughs> You've been so good to me. He said, I want to give you something that I own. He said, reach down under the bed and grab that baseball bat. She reached down, she grabbed that baseball bat. She had no idea. He gave her that bat, he died. She took that bat home, she put it under her bed where it stayed for years until she retired. And she thought to herself, you know, I've always dreamed of opening a restaurant, but I didn't have any money to open this restaurant. I'm going to see, there must be a reason he gave me that bat. I'm going to go see. She took it to a sports memorabilia store. And when she walked in with that bat, that vendor looked at it and he's like, could it be? Could it be that this is the one of seven bats that's been missing? So he takes it and goes through the appraisal that he's been looking to go through or, or has to go through to verify something. And come to find out, he verifies this is the one of seven bats that had vanished and nobody knew where it was that was autographed by Babe Ruth that was a home run bat. In 2006, she auctioned off that bat and she got $1.26 million for that bat. No idea the value of that bat set under her bed for years. And with the, with the money that she got from that bat, she opened her restaurant, but then she gave the rest of it to a children's foundation that Babe Ruth had helped in his life along the way. And she was asked, why did you give the rest of that money to that children's foundation? And these were his, her words. The bat was only valuable because Babe Ruth's name was on it. Since he made it valuable, the only reasonable thing I could do was something that would honor his life. If you are a follower of Christ in this room today, you have the name of one on your life that is greater than any other name on this earth. You carry the name of Jesus Christ on you. And the only reasonable and honorable thing for us to do is to give ourselves completely to him and honor him with our life and let our boldness speak boldly about what we believe deeply but let it reflect a broken spirit and a contrite heart. We cannot let the world around us that wants to silence what they don't tolerate keep us from continuing to speak boldly about what we believe deeply. 
We've got to carry that in our faith. This is what an older part of this generation must continue to model for a younger part of this generation. And a younger part of this generation must carry this into future generations that we will speak boldly about what we believe deeply from a broken spirit and a contrite heart out of love for what Christ has done for us. If you need prayer in any way today, we would love for you to reach out to us. You can go to our website, bwccamden.com, go to our contact page. You'll find the link there to uh, request prayer or send us anything that you uh, would like to communicate with us today. Or you can also simply text the word prayer to 803-676-7566 and we will be back in touch with you to find out how we can be in prayer for you. God bless you. We hope that you have a great week.